All right, we might as well get started. Um, as we kind of get going, I just want to start off by asking just kind of to begin with, and we'll leave it crack because I know for a fact some are coming in in a minute. Um, you know, are there any questions that we've covered that kind of coming in that we're kind of sitting? We'll have some time at the very end for questions tonight because hopefully tonight doesn't just take too long. But um, I wanted to leave a little time for questions at the end. But are there any questions regarding just anything we've covered thus far in relation to um, to the subject matter and, and this process, this interpretive journey? Any thoughts? Okay. Well, tonight we want to wrap up with application. And as we talk about the way in which we look at application, one of the things that I spoke of last night, and I want to be, I want to be sure I'm clear on it, is that as we get into interpretation and we get into looking at what the Word of God actually says, the what does it mean part. We talked about how what the scripture means is the same today as it was yesterday. It's the same today for the ancient audience as it is for our audience. So the meaning of scripture, what God is telling us is the same thing. How we are supposed to react to that is where there, there is inevitably some variance in where and how we apply it because of some things that are different in our world. Now, that variance is not in truth. That variance is in a lot of the ways in which it, it actually comes, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And let me explain what I mean by that. The, the variance in application is going to have to do with the differences between what we have and what they have. For example, when I made mention of the, the analogy of the tongue and how powerful the tongue is. We live in an age where the tongue is still a powerful and difficult thing. What the scripture was telling us in that moment and what God was portraying to us is that what we say has weight and what we say either brings honor or dishonor to God. And the tongue being a small member, being a small part of our body has an exponential um, power because of its ability to harm. Now, I would argue that the tongue today has an even greater problem and a greater power than it did then because of the, the fact that the, the, the scope of the tongue has been expanded so much. So the application here is not back then when it would have been much more spoken word and some written word to where now it is much more of words that go out on Snapchat or Facebook or things like that, as well as written word and spoken word and, and all those things. So it still means the same thing it meant then. It's just its application has been broadened so much because the idea of what words do today has been broadened so much. And so um, carelessness in those areas has a, a much larger impact today than it did even then. One's written words back then might impact a small group of people around them, or their spoken word for sure would be a small group. When you wrote them down and put them on tablets and papyrus and things like that, it would have been a greater group because more people over time could have read what you said. Today, with one push of a button, your words if they're careless, can set of even greater fire. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the application. It doesn't change at all what the Scripture's telling us about the impact or what, what's the truth that lies there. It's just how we're going to apply it. Because if we go back to apply it exactly like they did, then we would think, well, if I'm not saying it or if I'm not writing it down with a pencil on papyrus, then it's not that big a deal. And I would argue that that is not the correct application. So to get to application, I think one of the things that we really, really need to do is let's go back to the Scripture. Because I don't think that if we go anywhere other than this, we're going to find the right place and the right way to apply the Word of God. Let's look at John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. It says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, 
for he dwells with you and will be with you. Let's look at John chapter 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And then 1 John 5, 2 through 3. But this, by this we know that we love, that, I'm sorry, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Now, the reason I read those things, and the reason I want to look at those things is, and in one, you notice I kept, I stayed true to, to using just John. And I wanted to use John, and I use these verses in John's, um, John's gospel and in the first letter to John, because John uses a similar language to portray what he's trying to get us to understand. And what John is trying, and, and what John is looking at and he's saying to us is this. There's more to the application, correct application of the Word of God in our willingness to demonstrate our love for God in obedience to God. Knowing what God says is a big part of it. That's a huge piece of it. That's what we spent all these days trying to figure out. How do we know what God said? But it makes no difference if we know what God says if we don't take it to that next level where application becomes behavior, where application becomes a heart change. Where, and, and understand, the heart change happens by the Spirit of God, and then it's an outpouring of behavior. So let's look at how that looks and some, just some takeaways from this idea of application. All appropriate application must lead us to obedience to God. That's the first thing I get from this combination of three, or three passages that I read. All application, right application, would lead us to obedience to God. This is where if I test the Scripture by the rest of the Word of God, by the biblical map, and my application does not lead me or points me in the direction that I believe or I look at through the rest of the Word that is in, that is in contradiction to the Word of God, then I'm, I'm making some mistakes in my application. And if my application doesn't give me something to do and something to be and something to strive for in what I'm doing, then I've also missed it. Because application, God is not about us just knowing. God is about us responding. He wants us to love and to be obedient. The next thing that I see or that I wanted to point out is that obedience is an outpouring of love and never burdensome. You cannot white-knuckle yourself into obedience to God. You cannot make yourself be obedient to God. You cannot make yourself apply the Word of God. The Word of God, your obedience to the Word of God comes out of an outpouring of the Spirit of God who has changed you and it manifests itself in obedience and that obedience is never burdensome. Now, I want to be careful how I put this never burdensome piece because I think it's critical. I'm not telling you that obedience is never hard. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that through the process of obedience, when you look back upon your life, you do not see obedience as a burden. Today, withstanding the, the fiery flames of Satan, today, running from temptation, today, looking Satan in the face and telling him to flee you, doing all these things, conquering your fears of, of rejection and all that. When you go and you look at trying to be obedient to God, those things are going to be difficult for you today. They are going to be the kinds of things that as you, as you lay hold to them, they're going to take some determination and there's going to take some stick to and there's going to be some, some real steadfastness in what you do. There's some work there that you got to do. But I promise you this, that when you're obedient to Christ and you live your life that way and you look back upon the work that you did, it is not burdensome. 
you remember that work and, and you will cherish that work and you will, you will be honored by that work. When you read about in Proverbs, the, 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 the virtuous woman, that is a hard working woman. And one of the things that's so evident about what you see in that hardworking woman is it comes back and it says, and her children will call her blessed. That the work was not burdensome for her, but I guarantee you it was hard at the time she did it. But by looking back on them, that burden is not there. You don't regret is what this is saying. You don't regret the work you did in trying to work yourself and, and do these things. Now, now let me go back and make sure you understand what I'm saying by the work you're doing. The Spirit of God and the same gospel that brought forth your salvation as the free gift of God is also the same God that's bringing forth your successful works. It's the same thing that's giving you that power to do all things that you do in the name of Christ. Okay, So I don't ever want you to think that, that somehow we're left on our own to just simply carry this burden alone because Christ is doing that. And that's where we get to at the next point. And, and this is a combination of several of the, the verses there that says, The Spirit of truth, our helper, lives inside of the believer and guides us to obedience. I, sh I could add to that, not only does it guide us to obedience, but it strengthens us to obedience. And I would go so far as to say that all true obedience is the work of the Spirit of God in us. And so as we see those things happening, we understand, guys, and I, and I want to say this about the Holy Spirit and when we think about we have neglected the Holy Spirit in, in our denominational world, partly because of some fear of places that emphasize the Spirit. You know, there's, and, and, but, but, and, and there's some reasons that's not necessarily a terrible thing, except for the fact that we have neglected sometimes to teach our children that this Spirit, this helper that Christ sent us, is co-equal to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So when we look at this helper that we have, guys, this helper is more present than Christ when he was on the earth. Because Christ, when he was on the earth, was limited to where he could go and where he could be. But this helper lives inside of every single believer, every blood-bought believer in Christ. The helper is with them. So his presence in the life of you is literally tied to the fact that he has changed you and transformed you. And I don't want to make light of that because that is out of that presence that our obedience pours. Okay? And if we forget that, then we will get to the point when we have a good day, we think it's about us. And that's not true. When we have a good day, we want to thank God for the allowing us to be a part of the labor that He's given us to labor in. And we want to thank Him for giving us the Spirit to see that labor to produce fruit. That's the reality that, that we have when we look at this. Now, let's look at the next thing. Application. Next point. And this is kind of going back to the first one, but I just don't want to miss it. The Spirit of God, when He brings us to application, will never direct us, will never direct you or me, either one, contrary to the rest of God's Word. Um, this is where you're going back and you're making sure that what you're, you're constantly coming back to the fact that God's Word is consistent and that, the, that a singular passage will not direct you to a to a, a truth or to an application that would be disobedient to the other parts of the Word of God. Okay, now remember this, and, and this is where the difficulty sometimes comes in with us. You really have to be careful when you're looking at that New Covenant, Old Covenant, New Testament, Old Testament, and how you're looking at the interplay between the two of them. Because sometimes you look at the Old Testament, and some of the commands in the law have been transformed by the new covenant and what Christ has done. So there's a lot of people that get caught up in obeying this law. The, the covenant that Christ has brought to us is, is different in many ways in some of the application. So we've got to be careful that we don't just get caught up in that. All right, the next one is our assurance or your assurance, our assurance is bound up in, right, in your right application of the word of truth. Notice what I said, not your salvation, there are brothers and sisters in Christ that have got parts of Scripture wrong. They have applied it wrong. They, don't, they, aren't, they, they didn't interpret it right. 
and I'm one of them. All right, that's the truth. There are parts of Scripture that I have not interpreted correctly, and I certainly have applied them wrong. I don't always know what they are, and I can't put one on. I don't think I have right now, but I know they're there. Those parts of Scripture that I've missed are not going to keep me from being saved. And the same thing goes for a lot of the things where other people, other bro brothers and sisters in Christ, they, they are going to have some things that they get wrong. We've got people, other denominations, other Christians, that they have been transformed by the Spirit. They've been born again. They know Christ. They're going to be in heaven with us. But this application, correct application of the Word of God, is where our assurance comes from. It is the testing of our faith. If you look back and, and, and you see that, it, it's the reality that you can't have assurance outside of obedience. And let me put it to you this way. If you think you can live your life any kind of way, don't ever worry about what God says. Don't ever worry about how God would have you live your life. And then one day you're going to lay on your deathbed and go, but you know what? Here I come, Lord, and you have this deep hope, you're going, to be, you're, you're going to be scared out of your mind on that day. Okay, that's, you're going to be terrified on that day. However, if you live your life in obedience to Christ and to His commands, you will be rewarded for that. You will be rewarded for that with an assurance that when you lay on your deathbed, when you're getting to the end of your life or you're coming to that point, you will have assurance because the Holy Spirit will lay witness to that. Okay? Now, there are some that are going to go to heaven without assurance. That's just true. But the reality is, is that idea that you've, as you've put through your life, you rightfully applied the Word of God, that builds in your life an assurance that, that can help you and help you be encouraged by that. So I don't, I, I, I say all that because I just want us to see where we come to, um, where we come to much of the hope. We, we sometimes teach and preach that we want people to have hope and, and yet people don't, don't live out their life in a way that hope is really um, manifest in them. Think about the scripture where, G, where God is teaching in, or where scripture teaches, if you abide in Christ, he will abide in you. That's that idea of you walking with Christ and abiding in Him and He abides in you, okay? That's a growing assurance as time goes on. Um, some of the most blessed saints are the ones who have followed Christ throughout their entire life, and this obedience breeds that. Um, and and I, know, I know that can be kind of, again, I don't want to ever think, I want you to go out from here and say that what I told you is that your salvation is tied to your obedience. Your obedience is, is your proof. And, and here's another thing that, that kind of comes from this. Sometimes we want to teach people that their salvation or that their assurance is tied to an event or a time. Like we'll say, my, our, our youngest daughter the other day um, came and told us she wanted to be baptized. We've questioned her up and down, left and right, up and down, trying to make sure she's, she's got this thing down. And... There's going to come a day, February 4th, I think she's going to be baptized sometime last few weeks, months. She, uh, I believe she gave her life to Christ. She's going to have a year in her mind, 2003, 2004, that she was saved. I don't ever want my daughter to look back and say, I was saved in 2003 and my assurance is based upon my knowledge of that date. I want my daughter to be able to look back and say that my desire to follow God in Christ, my love for the saints, my love for His Word, my perseverance through this life, my hope in the salvation that is to come, that I want her to see that her obedience to the Word bears forth fruit in her life. I want that to be her assurance. Okay, And so if she doesn't have those things, I want her to go back and, quit, and I want her to think about it. And I want her to seek God and I want her to come back to that. That's what it means when we talk about the perseverance of the saints and that working out our salvation. It's that idea that this obedience is what brings forth this thing. If you want to look a little bit more about your assurance, I would encourage you to read 1 John in its entirety because I think 1 John is one of the most um, beautiful uh, treatments of the assurance of salvation. But... I say all that to come back to this point of application. Application is where our obedience to Him 
and our understanding of the right, what we've just interpreted, comes to, comes to, to reality and we put it to play. Now, as I talked to you the other day, I want us to go through, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this passage of Scripture. Um, and I want to teach us from this passage of Scripture, not totally related to what we've done here this week, but I want to show you some things that you can gain from just the understanding of the things we talked about, this interpretive journey. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 3. Did I? Was that on their last Yep. <laughs> but let me say this, Daryl. I might have said first and wrote up second because Amy pointed out to me last night that I made a lot of mistakes on my PowerPoint. So I am not beyond. I'm sorry. I'm No, you're good. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm going to read the chapter, but I want us to, we're going to come back to it. It says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happening as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith but the Lord is faithful he will establish you and guard you against the evil one and we have the evil one and we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command may the Lord direct you your heart to the love of God and to the steadfastness fastness of Christ. Now we command, command you, brothers, you, you brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accordance in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because you were not idle when we were with you. Nor did you eat anyone, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with, with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be burdened to, a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their, li their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If, you, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, Take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the, it is the way I write, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right, the last part we won't cover, but I want to I go back and, and I want to kind of talk with you just a bit about some of this. I'm going to pull out my notebook because I made a jot down a few notes. But as we talk about this stuff, I want to I wanna just look at a few things with you about this and kind of look back. Let's talk first about what, who this audience is that he's talking, talking to. The, the people of Thessalonica were a, were a people that, that Paul does a lot of bragging on them. Paul brags on them in 1 Thessalonians. He brags on them in 2 Thessalonians. And he talks about how their labor of love and how their conduct has been something to be marveled at. He actually goes in 1 Thessalonians and talks about a gift that they have given to Paul for his ministry. And he thanks them for that gift and he talks about how that gift has become the example that other churches that he has, he has focused on, those other churches are to look at their gift and say, this is a good thing that you have done. So Thessalonica is a church that Paul has a, a very warm place in his heart for. Um, Thessalonica is also, if you look at 1 Thessalonians and, and some of 2 Thessalonians, it is, a, it is a, a chapter where Jesus or Paul focuses a lot on the life to come. 
He, he looks back and he talks about the life to come. He talks about them um, being aware of what the life is going to look like and things like that. And so that's a big focus, which gives us a real hint of what the, what the problem might have been in Thessalonica when they were going through that. And, and as we come to that, he actually in 2 Thessalonians 2, he points out to the fact that there is some, there is some type of fear as it relates to the second coming of Christ. Now, this fear that has come about as we look at this, and, and many biblical scholars believe this is the fear, they believe they've missed the second coming. They think they've missed it. And one of the problems that's happened is they think they've missed it, and, and that, that kind of puts them in a, in a sour note. That kind of puts the people of Thessalonica in this idea that we missed it, and therefore there's a depression. There's kind of a, 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 an ill feel about this idea that they've missed it. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, he basically assures them that you have not missed it. There are some things that are going to come about that you're going to see, and when they come about, you will know. Now, Paul is still in the, under the impression that the second coming of Christ could happen in his lifetime. And so Paul is prophesying on some things that's going to happen but what he doesn't know is they don't happen during his lifetime. Okay, so they're going to happen in life, somebody's lifetime that sits under the reading of Paul and can read this and know this. And so that is going to come about at some point. But as we look at this, there's a couple of things we also need to know about that age. You and I think of work in, in many, many ways. But one of the things, do you remember when we had COVID? How many of y'all remember this term that they used during COVID? We've got non-essential and we have essential workers. You remember that? Wasn't that great? Yeah. All right. And, and, you know, and it was obvious the non-essential workers were important or were not important. And the essential workers were important, right? It was this, this dialogue, this, this reality of these people are important, these people are not important and all this stuff. Guys, what a weird reality. Let me tell you what a worker was back in those days. A worker was a contributor to society. In a, in a world where everybody's working for very much survival, we, we work in a world for leisure and comfort. How many of us, and I mean, just think for a minute, how many people in our world today work in industries where the idea of what they're doing goes to work when they go to work is for so that somebody can enjoy some level of leisure in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you think about the, the 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 entertainment industry, you think about the sports industries, you think about you just name it. And there are so many people that work in industries that are really about people enjoying life, not living life, if you know what I mean. Okay, so the reality what I'm getting at is people. You, when you've got blacksmiths and stonesmiths and, and you've got people who are growing food and you've got people who are cooking food and you've got people who are building homes and you've got people who are doing all these things, there were no such thing as non-essential workers. Okay, and so the reality is, is when they're talking about workers, they're talking about contributors to society. This is a thing that sometimes we can kind of miss as we talk about this. But Paul also talks about the example that he sets as a worker. In the middle of this, he says that I gave you an example in my own labor of what work you should be about doing. And he also goes back, if, if you read 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, he uses this almost exact same phraseology to them when he talks about the work that he did among them the first time. So in both letters, he mentions his labor. Now, I think it's important that we realize that Paul labor, Paul's labor was really twofold. Paul's labor was physical labor. He did some things when he was there. He did not ask. He, he, he was working hard at it, but his labor was in the Word of God. His labor was the ministry of the church of God, teaching the people to understand and, and know the Word of God. That was his labor, okay? Now, he also goes on to tell people in this pace, he said, though, to work... He told them to work out their living as well. So he's not just talking about what he did, but he's talking about what they're doing as well. He's saying, dude, do this quietly. Now, a couple things that I want you to look at when we talk about this. First of all, this rebuke that he gives is a serious rebuke. Just think for just a minute as he goes down through here and he says, Now I command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you to, stay, to, to keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not according 
to the traditions that, we, that you received from us. Now, think about it like this. When you look at this idea, we read the verses that follow about if a man does not work, he should, or if he will not work, he should not eat. How many times have we seen that applied to that bum on the street? You know what I'm saying? Somebody will say it. He'll drive up to somebody and they're begging food and he'll be like, you know what, if he, if he, if he will not work, he should not eat. Or we'll talk about somebody out in the world that, you know, they're lazy, whatever. We, we have this mindset of people. They're lazy. They're on the dole. They're all these things. What's interesting about this to me is that Paul is talking about within the church of Christ. He's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ who are not working, who are not about this. Now, the issue that they're not, why they're not working is most likely because they think they've missed the second coming and they're just basically, they've thrown their hands up and they say, well, well, what can we do? We've missed it. And so the reality is, is these, there's these people who are just not pulling their weight. Now, when you think about that, Paul says that we ought to break fellowship with them. He says, don't, don't spend time with that person. Don't put that person there. So there's a, there's a real harshness to the rebuke that Paul is giving here. There's a, real, there's a seriousness about his tone in this passage that we, we can't miss. But he goes on to tell them to be imitators of them and to go through the process of, of, of working through that. And Paul says, look, this is what we did. We ate your bread, but we worked for it. We did these things that we were supposed to do, and we, we weren't a burden to any of you. And, it was, and, and, and all these things, and, and through the process of doing this, we begin to realize that Paul has a real, there is no separation between your secular work and your spiritual work. See, sometimes we think that the people in the church Sometimes we think that the preachers and the youth ministers and the elders and the people in the church, well, they're responsible for the work. They're the ones that ought to be serious about this stuff. They're the ones that ought to be about this. And, and, and those of us that go outside of the church and, and work outside of the church and don't do those spiritual things, well, that's separate. But guys, here's the deal. We dishonor God when we are idle and we don't work hard at what we do. The reality is, is, is you cannot be wherever you are and be idle in one stance and then come around and say, whoa, whoa, I got an opportunity now to share the gospel. Let me tell you about Jesus. If you are a bad student, then people who, who look at you and realize that you're lazy and you're idle and you're a busybody are not going to hear you when all of a sudden your antennas fly up and you want to share the gospel. You've got to be about the Word. You've got to be about working hard because it's the example of hard work that sets you up for this moment in time. Now, don't be mistaken. That's not the only way. That's not the only work he's talking about because remember, this is Paul's example of what he did when he was there, his example that he showed. And we're going to come back to what that means and how that, that is. But we must understand that there is no such a thing as secular work for the Christian because everything we do, we do to honor God. And so when we put our hand to the plow, we do it to honor God. And it's important that we never forget that. So that's one of the truths that we, we pull from this and we understand. Now, as we look at this, notice what he says about the, the idleness. I think, I think we, we don't need to miss this term where he says the idleness produces a busybody. What an interesting word, busybody. What is meant by that word? What, what is a busybody? That's right. Have you ever heard in, in today's vernacular, I hear it all the time. Somebody come up to me and say, Mr. Granberry, that girl's just extra. <laughs> she's just extra. You know? That's what people tell me all the time, she's extra. Or, or you hear somebody say, she's messy. She's so messy. You know, you know what messiness comes from? You, let me tell you somebody who's not messy, a soldier in a foxhole. He's dirty, but he's not messy. All he's worried about is surviving. All he's worried about is doing what's best for himself and his brothers in combat. He ain't, he's not messy. Let that man go out on a night with his buddies outside of combat on some R&R &R time, now he gets messy. You see what I'm saying? Because he's no longer about the business. Guys, we don't as Christians have the luxury of being busybodies about a life that is trivial. And I want, 
on a convicting note to myself, to you, as we sit here today, how much of our life do we spend in things that have no eternal value whatsoever? They're not, they are not temporally good. They are not spiritually good. They are literally a waste of our time. Now understand, the Bible teaches a concept of rest where we rest our bodies. But, but guys, we spend, when we flip and scroll from, from one thing to the other, we're not resting. And I want you to think for a minute. Do you, do you know that one of the greatest inventions of our time, and I don't mean it great in the sense of, of it's good. I mean great in the sense of its impact was a code written by a, a man who invented the endless scrolling on social media. It, it's When you used to, when you flipped on Facebook and it was one of those early things or MySpace or anything, you would flip up and you would eventually get to the bottom of the last thing you could look at. It might be 20 posts, it might be 100 posts, but you would get to the bottom. That's as far as you could go. And so it just kept regenerating the, the top or last 20 things you could look at. But there was a man that came along and he said, if we can invent something where that bottom never comes, then people will never take their eyes off this. And guys, he's never been more right. And, it, and, and very few things in our, in our lifetime have affected the negativity of our lives than that endless scrolling. Now, I pick on that because it's easy to pick on. But I want us to think about it in our own lives. What is the convicting nature of this busybody mindset? This messy mindset. This idea that I'm not about the labor that God has, got, has, has put us to. But then I want to take us to the next application of this. And I want us to think about this back to what Paul was. What was the example that Paul gave? What was the labor that Paul had? Because I don't want us to miss that his labor was the example. He's telling us to live your life, but Paul's labor was this. He worked hard among them with some physical labor. He did some things. Most people believe that Paul continued to be a tent maker while during the day, kind of keeping, helping the living, not being a burden on the church, helping bring in some revenue to the people that he was around. So there was very likely that Paul continued to be a tent maker. But the reality of it is this, that Paul's real work was the understanding of what God had for him in his life and his willingness to minister to others in that. That was Paul's work. Because when Paul was working a tent so that he would not be a burden to the churches that he was at, while he was putting his hand to the plow in physical labor, his goal was to not be a burden to the church. Do you see the difference? His goal wasn't so that he could have more money so he could buy more gifts and stuff. His goal was to not be a burden to others. And so what we come to is Paul realized that he was going to labor both in his, with his hands and his heart in obedience to Christ. And I think when I come to this passage and I look at this, it is, it is extremely difficult for me to get past the fact that what we talked about this week was that labor. Many of us today are going to take what we talked about, and I'm not saying that the position, the things that I told you today are the only way you can understand the Word of God. It is a way. And, I, and I, it was my goal and my hope that everything that we talked about today would at least give you something to sort of sink your teeth in and begin to understand the Word of God more thoroughly and, 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 and beautifully. But guys, I've told you then and I'll tell you now, this is hard work. You have to get in the Word and you have to, to work in the Word so that you can understand it and you have to work to apply it and you have to work to, to, be, to, to see yourself, to be faithful to what God has said in His Word. You have to work at it. But remember what I said about application. It's never burdensome. Because what I will promise you this is if you'll put your hand to this plow, if you will work in this way, just the same way when you put your hand to the plow at work and you're rewarded for good work. When you, when you go to work and you become a diligent employee, you're rewarded for that type of stuff. Just like the world rewards you with monetary gain in this life, I'm telling you that God will exponentially reward you for the work you do to understand His Word and apply it rightfully to your life. And so what happens in your life with this is you look back upon this time, you look back upon the work that you do, and you say, God, thank you for what you've done. Guys, I'm going to tell you, the, the, 
I thank God for the six years of my life that I was in full-time ministry. I do two things here, and I want, to, I want to be honest. I want to, one, thank God for giving me the opportunity to be in full-time ministry for six years. I preached three sermons a week for six years. And the beauty of that was those six years transformed my heart to know the Word of God in a way that I didn't, I never knew it before. But can I confess to you, since those six years have gone, I've never put my hand to that plow. And guys, the reality is, is that the, the, the joy to know what God wants for your life is in these words. And the, the assurance of what happens when you are transformed by the reading of His Word and the understanding of His Word and the obedience to His call on your life, guys, that transforming power brings an assurance that I cannot, I cannot fathom that you would want to pass up. I can tell you this, this has been, Amy will tell you in a heartbeat, this has been one of the hardest laborsome weeks of my, of my last several years. I've, I've strained to do this, but guys, when I asked Chris if I could do this, I knew it would be. And I needed something in my life that would drive me back to the Word, and I needed community. I needed to know that you guys were going to show up every night and depend on me to have this word ready and this lesson prepared and you to have something to leave here with to the glory of God. And let me say this to you tonight. You cannot do this outside of community because if you show up to the, to the to fitness plex over there and you think you're going to work out every night for the next month or year and get strong and nobody's going to meet you there, about three weeks in, if you're lucky, you're going to stop. But get you a group of buddies together and y'all agree that you're going to show up every day and you're going to work out and you're way more likely to hang in there for the entirety of this year. But guys, even so much more the Word of God. If you come in this community, in this church, and you know that others are depending upon you, your family is depending upon you, everybody wants you to show up and do this work. Guys, I promise you that it will pay great and, and everlasting in, um, uh, rewards. So I say all that just to say thank y'all. I really, really appreciate y'all coming and being a part of this. I hope that as you look back, I know it was a lot. Every night I got home, I'd ask everybody, you know, I'm always seeking that approval, I guess you could say, but I'd ask the kids, hey, what'd you think? And I think the one, one thing I heard more than anything, it, was, it sure was fast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I do thank you for coming. And, and are there any questions before we close in prayer? Any thoughts? I don't have a question, but man, I want to tell you, I don't think anybody in here has enjoyed it as much as I have, man. It has been great. <laughs> well, Daryl, I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw your name on the list, I was pretty happy about that because I knew that, um, I knew you'd, I, I, I hoped you would appreciate it. And so I really am, I'm glad. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your encouragement. Well, guys, go ahead. Yes. Do you have, um, I know we talked about context and, and understanding what the readers would have mm -hmm. had in their background. Do you have any books in particular that you recommend for that? I do. I have several books that I do read or have looked at in the past and used a lot in the past. I have moved more exclusively toward um, online sources now, mainly because they've expedited my study a lot more. Um, and part of that is just because of that. And I told the class, I guess it was what, Wednesday night? Um, no, Tuesday night. One of the things, I think you missed it, the, the, the best resource that I can find out there free and that you can get, and you can get a lot of really good books that have been put online and resources that were once in print form was Blue Letter Bible. And it's, it's got a lot there. You need to research the various contributors to that. Don't just jump way, way in. You know, when you, when you pull, when you look on there and you click on there what they offer, don't don't just assume that every single person on there bringing the same level of integrity and, and, and what you would think would be trustworthy. But there's a lot of really good people. Um, I know you can, yeah, John MacArthur I know contributes to that. So there's, a, there's a, usually an introduction or something from him. Um, there's also Matthew Henry who's, uh, who's written a lot in that and he's one that's harder to read, he's older as far as the text, but, but some of those stuff. And then there's several others. And a lot of the background information, there's an ESV global. Um, don't, get the, don't let the global worry you. It's global in the sense of trying to give people context from a global sense of what was meant 
and some of the background. It's the same publishers of, of the ESV that we use that, that's one of the trusted versions that we use. So it's, it's, it's got good stuff, a lot of background stuff that's well vetted and stuff. So there's some really good stuff there. That's an easy context. You don't have to spend a lot of money on that. And that's been kind of my thing. I, 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 want, I need to find something that doesn't cost a ton. All right, any other? Well, let's pray and, um, and then we'll, we'll be able to go. Lord, I thank you for just giving me this opportunity to come and to be a part of this. Lord, you have strengthened me in my heart and in my spirit to be able to see these that have come, Lord, showing up to, to hear your, um, Lord, to hear others teach not only your word, but just to share their heart, Lord. And I, I pray, God, that if error has, has come from my lips um, through this process, that, Lord, you would that, Lord, you would um, shut that error down and, and that, that they would seek um, counsel from some that would correct it. Lord, I pray that you would um, guide the, the truth that has been shared, that, Lord, you would um, multiply it in their lives, that, that these students and, and adults that have been here could, could, Lord, foster a passion for your word and a willingness to, to work hard at, um, at seeing your, your truth revealed. But Lord, I pray more than anything that as we talk about the work and we talk about the things that we, we could do or should do, Lord, that I pray that you would never um, let us miss and forget that you are the God that gives the increase, that Lord, you are the one who sent us the helper and the Holy Spirit. You are the one that both revealed it and, and gave it to us in the beginning, and you are the one who who brings light to it today. So Lord, I pray that we would never forget our dependence upon you to know what you would have us to know. Lord, give us a willing heart, and I thank you that none of this is burdensome. I pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.